Greetings, everyone. I am Donald J. Trump, and I welcome you to this fantastic audiobook version of my book, The Art of the Deal, published in 1987. This book talks about my childhood in Jamaica Estates, Queens. It also describes my early work in Brooklyn prior to moving to Manhattan and building the Trump Organization, my actions and thoughts in developing the Grand Hyatt Hotel and Trump Tower, in renovating Woolman Rink, and regarding various other projects. As such, it represents a throwback and a snapshot of my time in the 70s and 80s. I had lots of fun writing this one, and I sincerely hope you will have a great time listening. But without further ado, The Art of the Deal. Chapter One, Dealing, A Week in the Life. I don't do it for the money. I've got enough, much more than I'll ever need. I do it to do it. Deals are my art form. Other people paint beautifully on canvas or write wonderful poetry. I like making deals, preferably big deals. That's how I get my kicks. Most people are surprised by the way I work. I play it very loose. I don't carry a briefcase. I try not to schedule too many meetings. I leave my door open. You can't be imaginative or entrepreneurial if you've got too much structure. I prefer to come to work each day and just see what develops. There is no typical week in my life. I wake up most mornings very early, around six, and spend the first hour or so of each day reading the morning newspapers. I usually arrive at my office by nine and I get on the phone. There's rarely a day with fewer than 50 calls and often it runs to over a hundred. Uh, and in between, I have at least a dozen meetings. The majority occur on the spur of the moment and few of them last longer than 15 minutes. I rarely stop for lunch. I leave my office by 6.30, but I frequently make calls from home until midnight and all weekend long, it never stops and I wouldn't have it any other way. I try to learn from the past, but I plan for the future by focusing exclusively on the present. That's where the fun is. And if it can't be fun, what's the point? Monday, 9 a.m. My first call is to Alan Ace Greenberg on the trading floor of Bear Stearns, a major Wall Street investment banking firm. Alan is the CEO of Bear Stearns. He's been my investment banker for the past five years, and he's the best there is. Two weeks ago, we began buying stock in Holiday Inns. It was selling in the 50s. As of this morning, Alan tells me, I own just over 1 million shares, or slightly more than 4% of the company. The stock closed Friday at $65 a share, mostly, Alan says, because word is out on the street that I've been a big buyer, and there's speculation I am planning a run at the company. The truth is I'm keeping my options open. I may ultimately go for a control of holiday, which I think is somewhat undervalued. At the current stock price, I could get control for less than $2 billion. Holiday's three casino hotels could be worth nearly that much. And the company owns another 300,000 hotel rooms besides. A second option, if the stock price goes high enough, is to sell my stake and take a very nice profit. If I did that today, I'd already be up about $7 million. The third possibility is that Holiday may eventually offer to buy back my shares at a premium, simply to get rid of me. If the premium is big enough, I'll sell. In any case, I enjoy seeing the lengths to which bad managements go to preserve what they call their independence, which really just means their jobs. 9.30 a.m., Abraham Hirschfeld calls me looking for advice. Abe is a successful real estate developer, but he wants to be a politician. Unfortunately for Abe, he's a far better developer than politician. This fall, Abe tried to run for lieutenant governor against Governor Cuomo's hand-picked candidate, Stan Lundeen. Cuomo led a court fight to get Hirschfeld off the ballot on technical grounds. And sure enough, halfway into the campaign, the court ruled Hirschfeld out. Abe knows I'm friendly with the governor, and he wants my advice now on whether he should endorse Cuomo or switch parties and endorse Cuomo's opponent. I tell him it's a no-contest question. Stick with a winner and a good guy at that. We set a meeting for Thursday. 10 a.m., I called Don Imus to thank him. Imus has one of the most successful radio shows in the United States on WNBC, and he's been helping to raise money for the Annabelle Hill Fund. 
I'm amazed at how this has snowballed into such a media event. It began last week when I saw a national news report by Tom Brokaw about this adorable little lady from Georgia, Mrs. Hill, who was trying to save her farm from being foreclosed. Her 67-year-old husband had committed suicide a few weeks earlier, hoping his life insurance would save the farm, which had been in the family for generations. But the insurance proceeds weren't nearly enough. It was a very sad situation, and I was moved. Here were people who'd worked very hard and honestly all their lives, only to see it all crumble before them. To me, it just seemed wrong. Through NBC, I was put in touch with a wonderful guy from Georgia named Frank Argenbright, who'd become very involved in trying to help Mrs. Hill. Frank directed me to the bank that held Mrs. Hill's mortgage. The next morning, I called and got some vice president on the line. I explained that I was a businessman from New York and that I was interested in helping Mrs. Hill. He told me he was sorry, but that it was too late. They were going to auction off the farm, he said, and nothing or no one is going to stop it. That really got me going. I said to the guy, you listen to me. If you do foreclose, I'll personally bring a lawsuit for murder against you and your bank on the grounds that you harassed Mrs. Hill's husband to his death. All of a sudden, the bank officer sounded very nervous and said he'd get right back to me. Sometimes it pays to be a little wild. An hour later, I got a call back from the banker and he said, don't worry, we're going to work it out, Mr. Tramp. Mrs. Hill and Frank Argenbright told the media, and the next thing I knew, it was the lead story on the network news. By the end of the week, we'd raised $40,000. Imus alone raised almost $20,000 by appealing to his listeners. As a Christmas present to Mrs. Hill and her family, we've scheduled a mortgage-burning ceremony for Christmas Eve in the atrium of Trump Tower. By then, I'm confident we'll have raised all the money. I promised Mrs. Hill that if we haven't, I'll make up any difference. I tell Imus he's the greatest, and I invite him to be my guest one day next week at the tennis matches at the U.S. Open. I have a courtside box, and I used to go myself almost every day. Now I'm so busy, I mostly just send my friends. 11.15 a.m., Harry Usher, the commissioner of the United States Football League, calls. Last month, the jury in the antitrust suit we brought against the National Football League ruled that the NFL was a monopoly, but awarded us only token damages of $1. I've already let the better players on my team, the New Jersey Generals, sign with the NFL. But the ruling was ridiculous. We argue about the approach we should take. I want to be more aggressive. What worries me, I say to Harry, is that no one is pushing hard enough on an appeal. 12 o'clock noon, Jerry Schoenfeld, head of the Schubert organization, the biggest Broadway theater owners calls to recommend a woman for a job as an office administrator. He tells me the woman specifically wants to work for Donald Trump. And I say she's crazy, but I'll be happy to see her. We talk a little about the theater business and I tell Jerry, I'm about to take my kids to see Cats, one of his shows, for a second time. He asks if I'm getting my tickets through his office. I tell him that I don't like to do that sort of thing. Don't be silly, he says. We have a woman here whose job it is to handle tickets for our friends. Here's her number. Don't hesitate to call. It's a nice gesture from a very nice guy. 1.15 p.m., Anthony Gleedman stops by to discuss the Woolman Rink Project. Gleedman was housing commissioner under Ed Koch. At the time, we fought a lot, and even though I ended up beating him in court, I always thought he was bright. I don't hold it against people that they have opposed me. I'm just looking to hire the best talent wherever I can find it. Tony has been helping to coordinate the rebuilding of the Woolman Skating Rink in Central Park, a project the city failed at so miserably for seven years. In June, I offered to do the job myself. Now we're ahead of schedule, and Tony tells me that he set up a press conference for Thursday to celebrate the last important step in construction, pouring the concrete. And it doesn't sound like much of a news event to me, and I ask him if anyone is likely to show up. He says at least a dozen news organizations have RSVP'd, yes. So much for my news judgment. 2 p.m., I get deposed in a lawsuit we've brought against a contractor on Trump Tower, 
Halfway into the job, we had to fire the company for total incompetence and we're suing for damages. I hate lawsuits and depositions, but the fact is that if you're right, you got to take a stand or people will walk all over you. In any case, there's no way I could avoid depositions, even if I never brought a lawsuit myself. Nowadays, if your name is Donald Trump, everyone in the world seems to want to sue you. 3 p.m. I ask Norma Furterer, my executive assistant and the person who keeps my life organized to bring me lunch, a can of tomato juice. I rarely go out because mostly it's a waste of time. 3.15 p.m., I put in a call to Sir Charles Goldstein. He's out and I leave a message. He's a successful real estate attorney, but not one of my favorites. I'm pretty sure Charlie Goldstein is from the Bronx, but he's a very pompous guy and has a tendency to act like royalty. So I call him Sir Charles. Over the weekend, I heard that Lee Iacocca had hired Sir Charles to represent him on a deal in Palm Beach, where Lee and I intend to be partners. Lee had no way of knowing about my past experience with Sir Charles. A while back, I was in the middle of making a deal with a guy who needed an attorney, and I recommended Sir Charles. The next thing I knew, Sir Charles was recommending to his client that he not make the deal with me. I couldn't believe it. This deal is to buy two condominium towers in the Palm Beach area. Uh, I own a house in Palm Beach, a spectacular place called Mar-a-Lago. Uh, and one day last winter, when I was down for the weekend, I went out to have lunch with some friends. On the way, a pair of beautiful gleaming white towers caught my eye. I made a couple of calls. It turned out they'd been built for about $120 million and a major New York bank had just foreclosed on the developers. The next thing I knew, I was making a deal to buy the project for $40 million. A mutual friend, William Fugazi, first mentioned that Lee and I should do a real estate deal together. I think Lee is an extraordinary businessman who has done wonders in turning Chrysler around, and I also like him a great deal personally. So one thing led to another, and we began talking about the towers. It's a substantial investment, and I'm not certain Lee is absolutely sure yet that he wants to go forward. If that's the case, it occurs to me, he's done the perfect thing by hiring an attorney I don't like. And that's precisely what I intend to tell Sir Charles when he calls me back. 3.30 p.m. I call my sister, Marianne Barry, to discuss a recent decision in a lawsuit we are contesting in Atlantic City. Marianne is a federal court judge in New Jersey and her husband, John, is a talented attorney I have used on many occasions. Can you believe they ruled against us? I ask her. Marianne is very smart. She obviously knows a lot more about the law than I do, and she's as surprised as I am. I tell her that I've arranged to have all the materials from the case sent to John immediately because I want him to handle the appeal. 4 p.m., I go to our conference room to look at slides of potential Christmas decorations for the atrium in Trump Tower. The spectacular six-story marble atrium has become one of the leading tourist attractions in New York City. More than 100,000 people a week come from all over the world to see it and shop in it, and it's now a symbol of the Trump Organization. That's why I still get involved in details like what Christmas decorations we should use. I don't like most of what I'm shown. Finally, I see a huge and magnificent gold wreath for the entrance to the building and decide we should use just that. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, less is more. 4.30 p.m., Nicholas Ribas, a New Jersey attorney who handled the licensing of both my Atlantic City casinos, calls to say he's about to leave for Sydney, Australia, to pursue a deal I'm considering. He tells me it's a 24-hour flight, and I tell him I'm very glad he's going instead of me. The deal, however, may be worth the trip. The government of New South Wales is in the midst of choosing a company to build and operate what they envision as the world's largest casino. We're a front runner for the job and Nick is going over to meet with the key government people. He tells me he'll call from Australia as soon as he has any news. 5.15 p.m., I call Henry Koenigsberg, the NBC executive in charge of choosing a new site for the network's headquarters. We've been courting NBC for more than a year, trying to get them to move to our West Side Yard site, 78 acres along the Hudson River that I bought a year ago, and on which I've announced plans to build the world's tallest building. I know Henry has just been shown our latest plans for the site, and I'm following up. I mentioned that Bloomingdale's is dying to become the anchor store in our shopping center, which will give it real prestige. I also tell him the city seems very excited about our latest plans. 
Then I say we expect to get our preliminary approvals in the next several months. Königsberg seems enthusiastic. Before I get off, I also put in a plug for NBC's locating its offices in the world's tallest building. Think about it, I say. It's the ultimate symbol. 5.45 p.m. My nine-year-old son, Donnie, calls to ask when I'll be home. I always take calls from my kids, no matter what I'm doing. I have two others, Ivanka, six, and Eric, three. And as they get older, being a father gets easier. I adore them all, but I've never been great at playing with toy trucks and dolls. Now, though, Donnie is beginning to get interested in buildings and real estate and sports, and that's great. I tell Donnie I'll be home as soon as I can, but he insists on a time. Perhaps he's got my genes. The kid won't take no for an answer. 6.30 p.m. After several more calls, I leave the office and take the elevator upstairs to my apartment in the residential part of Trump Tower. Of course, I have a tendency to make a few more calls when I get home. Tuesday. 9 a.m., I call Ivan Boski. Boski's an arbitrageur, but he and his wife are also the majority owners of the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I've just read that he's decided to sell it. I have no idea when I call that just two weeks from now, Boski will plead guilty to insider trading and that the real reason he's eager to sell the hotel is that he needs to raise cash fast. My idea is to hire Steve Rubel and Ian Schrager, the creators of Studio 54 and the Palladium, to run the Beverly Hills Hotel for me. Steve's an incredible promoter, and he'd make the hotel hot as hell again. I get Boski and tell him I'm very interested. He tells me Morgan Stanley and company is handling the deal, and I will get a call from their people shortly. Uh, I like Los Angeles. I spent a lot of weekends there during the 1970s, and I always stayed at the Beverly Hills. But I won't let my personal preferences affect my business judgment. Much as I like the hotel, I'm interested in it only if I can get it for a much better price than they're now asking. 9.30 a.m., Alan Greenberg calls. We bought another 100,000 shares of Holiday, and the stock is up another point and a half. Trading is very active. I tell Alan I've heard that the top guys at Holiday are in a panic and that they're holding emergency meetings to discuss how to react to me. Alan says that he thinks Holiday will enact some kind of poison pill as a way of fending off any attempts I make at a hostile takeover. Our call lasts less than two minutes. That's one thing I love about Alan. He never wastes time. 10 a.m., I meet with the contractors in charge of building my two 700-space parking garage and transportation center across the street from uh, Trump Plaza on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. It's a $30 million job, and they're here to give me a progress report. They tell me we're on schedule and under budget. The garage will be ready in time for Memorial Day 1987, the biggest weekend of the year in Atlantic City. And it's going to increase our business enormously. Right now, we are doing well with virtually no parking. The new lot is located at the end of the main road leading to the boardwalk. And it's connected by a walkway to our casino. Anyone who parks in the garage funnels directly into our facility. 10 a.m., I meet with the contractors in charge of building my two 700-space parking garage and transportation center across the street from uh, Trump Plaza on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. It's a $30 million job, and they're here to give me a progress report. They tell me we're on schedule and under budget. The garage will be ready in time for Memorial Day 1987, the biggest weekend of the year in Atlantic City and it's going to increase our business enormously. Right now, we are doing well with virtually no parking. The new lot is located at the end of the main road leading to the boardwalk, and it's connected by a walkway to our casino. Anyone who parks in the garage funnels directly into our facility. 12.15 p.m., Norma comes in and tells me that we have to switch the Wolman Rink press conference from Thursday to Wednesday. Henry Stern, the New York City Parks Commissioner, has a conflict. On Thursday, he is also scheduled to dedicate a new Central Park playground on the Upper West Side, underwritten by Diana Ross, the singer. The problem is that there's no way we can move our concrete pouring, which was why we called the press conference in the first place. But what the hell? I'll wing it and things will work out. I'm reluctant to give Henry a hard time. 
Last week, my security force refused to let him into Woolman without my written permission. This was taking good security a step too far. As you can imagine, Henry wasn't thrilled. 12.45 p.m., Jack Mitnick, my accountant, calls to discuss the tax implications of a deal we're doing. I ask him how bad he thinks the new federal tax law is going to be for real estate, since it eliminates a lot of current real estate write-offs. To my surprise, Mitnick tells me he thinks the law is an overall plus for me, since much of my cash flow comes from casinos and condominiums, and the top tax rate on earned income is being dropped from 50 to 32 percent. However, I still believe the law will be a disaster for the country, since it eliminates the incentives to invest and build, particularly in secondary locations, where no building will occur unless there are incentives. 1.30 p.m., I tell Norma to call John Danforth, the Republican senator from Missouri. I don't know Danforth personally, but he's one of the few senators who fought hard against the new tax bill. It's probably too late, but I just want to congratulate him on having the courage of his convictions, even though it might cost him politically. Uh, Danforth isn't in, but his secretary says he'll call back. 1.45 p.m., Norma sees an opening between calls, and she comes in to ask me about several invitations. Dave Winfield, the New York Yankee outfielder, has asked me to be the chairman of a dinner to benefit his foundation, which fights drug abuse. I'm already chairing two dinners this month, one for United Cerebral Palsy and the other for the Police Athletic League. I don't kid myself about why I'm asked to speak at or chair so many events. It's not because I'm such a great guy. The reason is that the people who run charities know that I've got wealthy friends and can get them to buy tables. I understand the game, and while I don't like to play it, there is no graceful way out. However, I've already hit up my friends twice this month, and there's only so many times you can ask people to donate $10,000 for a table. I tell Norma to turn Winfield down with regrets. The other invitation is from the Young President's Organization, asking me to speak at a dinner they're having, YPO admits businessmen under the age of 40 who are chief executives of their companies. I turned 42 months ago, so in their eyes, I guess I now qualify as an elder statesman. Norma also asked me about a half dozen party invitations. I say yes to two. One is being given by Alice Mason, the real estate broker, who has managed to turn herself into a major socialite by getting the hottest people to come to her parties. The other is a reception for two wonderful people, Barbara Walters of ABC and Merv Adelson, the head of Lori Marr Telepictures, who were married a few months ago in California. Frankly, I'm not too big on parties because I can't stand small talk. Unfortunately, they're part of doing business, so I find myself going to more than I'd like and then trying hard to leave early. A few, fortunately, I enjoy. But more often, I will accept an invitation many months in advance thinking the date is so far off that it will never arrive. When it does, I get mad at myself for having accepted in the first place. By then, it's usually too late to pull out. 2 p.m., I get an idea and call Alan Greenberg again. My idea is based on the fact that if I make a takeover move against Holiday, I have to get licensed as a casino operator in Nevada, where Holiday owns two casinos. What do you think, I ask him, about just selling out Holiday shares right now, taking a profit, and then rethinking a takeover bid after I get licensed. Alan argues for holding tight with what we've got. I say, okay, for now. I like to keep as many options open as I can. 2.15 p.m., John Danforth calls back. We have a nice talk, and I tell him to keep up the good work. 2.30 p.m. I return a call from one of the owners of the Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas. They also own perhaps the best undeveloped site on the Vegas Strip. For the right price, I'd consider buying it. I like the casino business. I like the scale, which is huge. I like the glamour. And most of all, I like the cash flow. If you know what you are doing and you run your operation reasonably well, you can make a very nice profit. If you run it very well, you can make a ton of money. 2.45 p.m., my brother Robert and Harvey Freeman, both executive vice presidents in my company, stop by to report on a meeting they've had that day with Con Edison and executives from NBC about the West Side Yards project. 
Con Ed has a large smokestack on the southern end of the site, and the meeting was to discuss whether the fumes from the stack would dissipate as effectively if a large building goes up adjacent to it. Robert, who is two years younger than I am, is soft-spoken and easygoing, but he's very talented and effective. I think it must be hard to have me for a brother, but he's never said anything about it, and we're very close. He is definitely the only guy in my life whom I ever call honey. Robert gets along with almost everyone, which is great for me, since I sometimes have to be the bad guy. Harvey is a different type, no nonsense, not too big on laughs, but he's got an absolutely brilliant analytic mind. The Con Ed people, I'm happy to hear, um, told the NBC executives that there is no reason to believe the presence of the NBC building will affect the smokestack. Unfortunately, Con Ed won't be the last word. Before we can get our approvals, we'll have to get an independent environmental impact statement. 3.15 p.m. I call Herbert Sturtz of the City Planning Commission, which will be the first city agency to approve or disapprove our latest plan for the West Side Yards. Sturtz and his people are scheduled to have a preliminary look on Friday. He isn't in, so I leave a message with his secretary. I just say I'm looking forward to seeing him Friday morning. 3.20 p.m., Gerald Schrager calls. Jerry's a top attorney at Dreyer & Traub, one of the best real estate firms in the country, and he's handled nearly every one of my major deals since I bought the Commodore Hotel back in 1974. Jerry is more than an attorney. He's an absolute business machine, and he can see through to the essence of a deal as fast as anyone I know. We talk about the Holiday Inn situation and several other deals that are in various stages. Like Alan Greenberg, Schrager isn't big on wasting time. We cover a half dozen subjects in less than 10 minutes. 3.30 p.m. My wife, Ivana, stops in to say goodbye. She's on her way to Atlantic City by helicopter. I like to kid her that she works harder than I do. Last year, when I bought my second casino from the Hilton Corporation and renamed it Trump's Castle, I decided to put Ivana in charge. She's incredibly good at anything she's ever done, a natural manager. Ivana grew up in Czechoslovakia, an only child. Her father was an electrical engineer and a very good athlete. And he started Ivana skiing very early. By the age of six, she was winning medals. And in 1972, she was an alternate on the Czechoslovakian ski team at the Sapporo Winter Olympics. A year later, after graduating from Charles University in Prague, she moved to Montreal and very quickly became one of the top models in Canada. We met at the Montreal Summer Olympic Games in August 1976. I dated a lot of different women by then, but I'd never gotten seriously involved with any of them. Ivana wasn't someone you dated casually. Ten months later, in April 1977, we were married. Almost immediately, I gave her responsibility for the interior decorating on the projects I had underway. She did a great job. Ivana may be the most organized person I know. In addition to raising three children, she runs our three homes, the apartment in Trump Tower, Mar-a-Lago, and our home in Greenwich, Connecticut. And now she also manages Trump's castle, which has approximately 4,000 employees. The castle is doing great, but I still give Ivana a hard time about the fact that it's not yet number one. I tell her she's got the biggest facility in town, so by all rights, it should be the most profitable. Ivana is almost as competitive as I am and she insists she's at a disadvantage with the castle. She says she needs more suites. She isn't concerned that building the suites will cost $40 million. All she knows is that not having them is hurting her business and making it tougher for her to be number one. I'll say this much, I wouldn't bet against her. 3.45 p.m. The executive vice president for marketing at the Cadillac division of General Motors is on the phone. He's calling at the suggestion of his boss, John Grettenberger, the president of the Cadillac Motors Division, whom I know from Palm Beach. Cadillac, it turns out, is interested in cooperating in the production of a new super stretch limousine that would be named the Trump Golden Series. I like the idea. We set a date to sit down and talk in two weeks. 4 p.m., Daniel Lee, a casino analyst for Drexel Burnham Lambert, stops by with several of his colleagues to discuss being my investment bankers on a deal to purchase a hotel company. Michael Milken, the guy who invented junk bond financing at Drexel, 
has called me regularly for the last several years to try to get me to bring my business to Drexel. I have no idea that Drexel is about to get enmeshed in the insider trading scandal that will soon rock Wall Street. In any case, I happen to think Mike's a brilliant guy. However, Alan Greenberg is exceptional himself, and I'm loyal to people who've done good work for me. I hear Lee and his guys out on their deal, but in truth, it doesn't excite me much. We leave it that I'll get back to them. 5 p.m., Larry Chonka, former running back for the Miami Dolphins, calls. He has an idea for keeping the USFL alive. He wants to merge it with the Canadian Football League. Larry's both a bright and a nice guy, uh, and he's very enthusiastic, but he doesn't convince me. If the USFL couldn't get off the ground with players like Herschel Walker and Jim Kelly, how is Canadian football with a lot of players nobody has heard of going to help? We've got to win in the courts first to break up the NFL monopoly. 5.30 p.m., I call Calvin Klein, the designer, to congratulate him. Back when Trump Tower first opened, Klein took a full floor of offices for his new perfume line, Obsession. It did so well that within a year, he expanded to a second floor. Now he's doing better than ever, and so he's taken over a third floor. I have a lot of admiration for Calvin, and I tell him so. He's a very talented designer, but he's also a very good salesman and businessman. And it's the combination of those qualities that makes him so successful. 6 p.m. I draft a letter to Paul Goldberger, architecture critic of the New York Times. A week ago in a Sunday column, Goldberger gave a great review to the design of Battery Park City, the new development in Lower Manhattan. He also called it a stunning contrast to what he claimed we're doing with the Television City Project at the West Side Yards. In other words, he killed us. There's just one catch. We're in the middle of designing our project with new architects and concepts, and nobody, including Goldberger, has seen our new plan. He was knocking a design he hadn't even looked at yet. Dear Paul, I write, your recent article is an obvious setup in preparation for the negative review you intend to do on Television City, no matter how great it is. Just think, if you are negative enough, which I'm sure you will be, you might even help convince NBC to move to New Jersey. My people keep telling me I shouldn't write letters like this to critics. The way I see it, critics get to say what they want to about my work, so why shouldn't I be able to say what I want to about theirs? Wednesday, 9 a.m., I go with Ivana to look at a private school for my daughter. If you had told me five years ago that I'd be spending mornings looking at kindergarten classrooms, I would have laughed. 11 a.m., I have a press conference for the Wallman Rink. When I get there, I'm amazed. There are at least 20 reporters and photographers milling around. Henry Stern, the parks commissioner, goes to the microphone first, and he is very complimentary to me. He says that if the city had tried to undertake the current renovation by itself, we would now be awaiting board of estimate approval for what Donald Trump has already done. When it's my turn, I explain that we've laid 22 miles of pipes, that they've all been thoroughly tested and there are no leaks, that the project is ahead of schedule by at least a month and under budget by about $400,000. I also announced that we've set a grand opening for November 13th and that we have a show planned for that day, which will include most of the world's great skaters. After I finish, the reporters ask a million questions. Finally, Henry and I step down into the rink. If we can't have a real concrete pouring, at least we'll have a ceremonial one. A couple of workmen pull over a wheelbarrow full of wet concrete and point it down toward us. Henry and I shovel some concrete onto the pipes while the photographers click away. As many times as I've done these things, I have to say I still find them a little ridiculous. Think of it. A couple of guys in pinstripe suits shoveling wet concrete. But I like to be accommodating. As long as they want to shoot, I'll shovel. 12.45 p.m. The minute I get back to my office, I start returning calls. I want to get as much done as I can now because I have to leave early for Trenton to attend a retirement dinner for a member of the New Jersey Casino Control Commission. The first person I call back is Arthur Barron, the president of Gulf and Western's entertainment group, which includes Paramount Pictures. Martin Davis, the chairman of G&W, 
has been my friend for a long time. And Barron apparently called in response to a letter I wrote to Marty two weeks ago. In the letter, I explained to Marty that I'd recently purchased a fantastic site and was in the midst of designing a building with eight motion picture theaters at its base. And I wondered if he might be interested in making a deal for them. As you are aware, I wrote, there is no one I would rather do business with than Marty Davis. That happened to be true, for Martin Davis is a truly talented man, but there are also a dozen other companies who would kill to have eight theaters in a top location. In other words, if I can't make a deal I like with Marty, I've got a lot of other options. As I anticipated when I get Art Barron on the phone, he wants to set up a meeting to discuss the theaters. We make a date for the following week. 1.30 p.m., I return a call from Arthur Sonnenblick, one of the city's leading brokers. Three weeks ago, Arthur called to say he had some foreign clients who were interested in buying the West Side Yards. He wouldn't tell me their names, but he said they were serious people and they were prepared to make me a very substantial offer for the site, far more than the $100 million I paid a year ago. I didn't get too excited. On the contrary, I say to Arthur, the bid sounds low. If you can get them higher, I might be interested. Now Arthur's calling to give me a status report. The truth is I really don't want to sell the yards at any price. To me, those 100 acres overlooking the Hudson River are the best undeveloped real estate site in the world. On the other hand, I don't want to rule out anything. Arthur tells me his clients are still very interested, that they may come up a little, but he doubts they'll go much higher. Keep pushing, I tell him. 2 p.m. The contractor who's building my pool at Mar-a-Lago is on the phone. I'm busy, but I take the call anyway. We're going to great lengths to build a pool in keeping with the original design of the house, and I want to make sure every detail is right. Buying Mar-a-Lago was a great deal, even though I bought it to live in, not as a real estate investment. Mar-a-Lago was built in the early 1920s by Marjorie Merriweather Post, the heiress to the Post serial fortune, and at the time, Mrs. Edward F. Hutton. Set on 20 acres that face both the Atlantic Ocean and Lake Worth, the house took four years to build and has 118 rooms. Three boatloads of Dorian stone were brought from Italy for the exterior walls, and 36,000 Spanish tiles dating back to the 15th century were used on the exterior and the interior. When Mrs. Post died, she gave the house to the federal government for use as a presidential retreat. The government eventually gave the house back to the Post Foundation, and the foundation put it up for sale at an asking price of $25 million. I first looked at Mar-a-Lago while vacationing in Palm Beach in 1982. Almost immediately, I put in a bid of $15 million, and it was promptly rejected. Over the next few years, the foundation signed contracts with several other buyers at higher prices than I'd offered, only to have them fall through before closing. Each time that happened, I put in another bid, but always at a lower sum than before. Finally, in late 1985, I put in a cash offer of $5 million, plus another $3 million for the furnishings in the house. Apparently, the foundation was tired of broken deals. They accepted my offer, and we closed one month later. The day the deal was announced, the Palm Beach Daily News ran a huge front page story with the headline, Mart Alago's Bargain Price Rocks Community. Soon, several far more modest estates on property, a fraction of Mar-a-Lago's size, sold for prices in excess of $18 million. I've been told that the furnishings in Mar-a-Lago alone are worth more than I paid for the house. It just goes to show that it pays to move quickly and decisively when the time is right. Upkeep of Mar-a-Lago, of course, isn't cheap, for what it costs each year, you could buy a beautiful home almost anywhere else in America, all of which is a long way of explaining why I take this call from the pool contractor. He has a small question about the matching of the Dorian stone we're using for the decking, and I care about every detail when it comes to Mar-a-Lago. The call takes two minutes, but it will probably save two days of work and ensure that the job doesn't have to be ripped out and done over later. 
2.30 p.m., a prominent businessman who does a lot of business with the Soviet Union calls to keep me posted on a construction project I'm interested in undertaking in Moscow. The idea got off the ground after I sat next to the Soviet ambassador, Yuri Dubinin, at a luncheon held by Leonard Lauder, a great businessman who is the son of Estee Lauder. Dubinin's daughter, it turned out, had read about Trump Tower and knew all about it. One thing led to another, and now I'm talking about building a large luxury hotel across the street from the Kremlin in partnership with the Soviet government. They have asked me to go to Moscow in July. 3 p.m. Robert stops in, and we talk about several issues relating to NBC and the West Side Yards. 3.30 p.m., a friend from Texas calls to tell me about a deal he's got working. He happens to be a very charming guy, wonderful looking, wonderfully dressed, with one of those great Texas drawls that make you feel very comfortable. He calls me Donnie, a name that I hate, but which he says in a way that somehow makes it okay. Two years ago, this same friend called me about another deal. He was trying to put together a group of wealthy people to take over a small oil company. Donnie, he said, I want you to invest 50 million. This is a no-lose proposition. You'll double or triple your money in a matter of months. He gave me all the details, and it sounded very good. I was all set to go forward. The papers were being drawn up, and then one morning I woke up and it just didn't feel right. I called my friend back and I said, you know, listen, there's something about this that bothers me. Maybe it's that oil is underground and I can't see it, or maybe it's that there's nothing creative about it. In any case, I just don't want to go in. And he said, okay, Donnie, it's up to you, but you're missing a great opportunity. The rest is history, of course. Oil went completely to hell several months later. The company his group bought went bankrupt and his investors lost every dime they put up. That experience taught me a few things. One is to listen to your gut, no matter how good something sounds on paper. The second is that you're generally better off sticking with what you know. And the third is that sometimes your best investments are the ones you don't make. Because I held back, I saved $50 million, and the two of us have remained friends. As a result, I don't want to reject him outright on his new deal. Instead, I tell him to send up the papers. In reality, I'm not too likely to get involved. 4 p.m., I call back Judith Krantz. You've got to give it to her. How many authors have written three number one best-selling books in a row? She also happens to be a very nice woman. Trump Tower is the setting for her latest novel, I'll Take Manhattan, and I'm a character in the book. At Judy's request, I agreed to play the role of myself in a scene from the miniseries based on her book and filmed at Trump Tower. Now, Judy is calling to say that the scene with Valerie Bertinelli came off well. I'm happy to hear it, although I'm not about to quit my day job. Still, I figure it's not a bad way to promote Trump Tower on national television in a miniseries that runs during Sweeps Week and is virtually guaranteed to get huge national ratings. 4.30 p.m. My last call is to Paul Hallingby, a partner at Bear Stearns, who handled the $550 million in bond issues we did successfully for our two casinos in Atlantic City during 1985. Now we're talking about setting up something called the Trump Fund, through which we'd buy distressed and foreclosed real estate, particularly in the Southwest, at bargain basement prices. Hallingby tells me that he's putting together a prospectus and that he's confident we'll easily be able to raise $500 million in a public offering. Now, what I like about the deal is that I'd retain a large equity position in any purchase we made, but I wouldn't be at any personal risk in the event that any of the deals went bad. What I don't like is the idea of competing with myself. What happens, for example, if I see a piece of distressed property that I want to buy on my own, but that might also be good for the fund? In any case, I'll look at the prospectus. 5 p.m., I'm driven to the 60th Street heliport in time to catch a helicopter and be in Trenton for cocktails at 5.30 p.m. Thursday, 9 a.m., I sit down with Abe Hirschfeld. Basically, Abe feels hurt that Governor Cuomo personally led a fight to push him off the ballot. I tell Abe I understand how he feels, but that the governor is a good guy and that in any event, it would look ridiculous for Abe, who is a Democrat, to suddenly turn around now and endorse a Republican. I also point out that as a practical matter, Cuomo is going to win re-election by a landslide and that it's a lot better to side with a winner than a loser. 
Abe is a pretty stubborn guy, but finally he says, look, why don't you get the governor to call me? I tell him I'll do my best. Abe has always been considered difficult, but I like him and his family a lot. 10.15 a.m., Alan Greenberg calls. The market is down 25 points less than an hour after opening. Alan tells me everyone's a seller, that nearly all stocks are down, but that holiday is holding firm. I can't decide whether I should be happy or sad. Part of me wants holiday to drop off so I can buy more at a better price. The other part of me wants it to go up because at this point, every time the stock rises a point, I make a lot of easy money. 10.30 a.m. Harvey Meyerson, the attorney who handled our USFL antitrust case, comes in for a meeting. Harvey is an incredible trial lawyer. He took a case in which no one gave us a prayer going in, and he managed to win on antitrust grounds, even though we were awarded only token damages. Even so, I've wondered since the trial whether perhaps Harvey was just a little too sharp for some of the jurors. Every day he'd show up in one of his beautiful pinstripe suits with a little handkerchief in his pocket, and I'm just not sure how well that went over. Overall, I think he did as good a job as anyone could, and I still believe he's our best hope on the appeal. One thing I like about Harvey is his enthusiasm. He's still absolutely convinced he's going to win the appeal. 11.30 a.m., Stephen Hyde calls. After I bought out, you know, Holiday Inn's interest in the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City and took over the management in June, I hired Steve to run the facility. Steve had been working as a vice president for Stephen A. Wynn at the Golden Nugget. Wynn is one of the best gaming guys around, and my philosophy is always to hire the best from the best. After a long-running negotiation, I offered Hyde a bigger job and more money, and he said yes. I think he also liked the idea of working for me, and he didn't mind leaving Steve Wynn. Wynn is very slick and smooth, but he's also a very strange guy. A couple of weeks ago, he called and said, Donald, I just wanted to let you know that my wife and I are getting divorced. So I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Steve. He said, oh, don't be sorry. It's great. We're still in love. It's just that we don't want to be married anymore. In fact, she's right here with me. Do you want to say hello? I politely declined. Hyde is calling to report on the August figures for the plaza, which just came in. He tells me that gross operating profit was just over $9,038,000 compared with $3,438,000 for the same period a year ago when I was still partners with Holiday Inns and they were managing the facility. Not too bad, I say to Steve, considering we still don't have any parking. Still, I can't resist razzing him a little. Now all you've got to do is get the hotel in mint condition. Wynn is very slick and smooth, but he's also a very strange guy. A couple of weeks ago, he called and said, Donald, I just wanted to let you know that my wife and I are getting divorced. So I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Steve. He said, oh, don't be sorry. It's great. We're still in love. It's just that we don't want to be married anymore. In fact, she's right here with me. Do you want to say hello? I politely declined. Hyde is calling to report on the August figures for the plaza, which just came in. He tells me that gross operating profit was just over $9,038,000 compared with $3,438,000 for the same period a year ago when I was still partners with Holiday Inns and they were managing the facility. Not too bad, I say to Steve, considering we still don't have any parking. Still, I can't resist razzing him a little. Now all you've got to do is get the hotel in mint condition. I'm a stickler for cleanliness, and last time I visited the hotel, I wasn't totally happy. We're working on it, Donald, Steve says good-naturedly. It's already improving. 12 o'clock noon, I walk over to the Woolman rink to watch the pouring of the concrete. This morning, all of the papers had stories about our press conference. When I get to the rink, it's surrounded by a convoy of cement trucks lined up as if they're in a military operation. HRH, the construction company in charge of the project, has done a fantastic job moving things along, but this has to be the most incredible sight yet. Thousands of pounds of wet concrete being poured from truck after truck into this huge rink. It's like watching the world's biggest cake get iced. Even though the press conference was yesterday, I noticed photographers and camera crews all over the place. This is the event everyone was waiting for. 
1.30 p.m., I sit down with a reporter from Fortune who is doing a story about real estate and the new tax laws with me on the cover. Contrary to what a lot of people think, I don't enjoy doing press. I've been asked the same questions a million times now, and I don't particularly like talking about my personal life. Nonetheless, I understand that getting press can be very helpful in making deals, and I don't mind talking about them. I just try to be very selective. Norma must turn down 20 requests a week from all over the world. Also, when I do give an interview, I always keep it short. This reporter is in and out in less than 20 minutes. If I didn't limit myself, I could spend my life talking to the press. 2.45 p.m. A friend of mine, a highly successful and very well-known painter, calls to say hello and to invite me to an opening. I get a great kick out of this guy because unlike some artists I've met, he's totally unpretentious. A few months back, he invited me to come to his studio. We were standing around talking when all of a sudden he said to me, do you want to see me earn $25,000 before lunch? Sure, I said, having no idea what he meant. He picked up a large open bucket of paint and splashed some on a piece of canvas stretched on the floor. Then he picked up another bucket containing a different color and splashed some of that on the canvas. He did this four times and it took him perhaps two minutes. When he was done, he turned to me and said, well, that's it. I've just earned $25,000. Let's go to lunch. He was smiling, but he was also absolutely serious. His point was that plenty of collectors wouldn't know the difference between his two-minute art and the paintings he really cares about. They were just interested in buying his name. I've always felt that a lot of modern art is a con and that the most successful painters are often better salesmen and promoters than they are artists. I sometimes wonder what would happen if collectors knew what I knew about my friend's work that afternoon. The art world is so ridiculous that the revelation might even make his paintings more valuable. Not that my friend is about to risk finding out. 4 p.m. A group of us meet in our conference room to go over the latest plans for the West Side Yards project, which we're scheduled to show to the city tomorrow morning. It turns out that Herb Sturz of the Planning Commission won't be able to attend, but his key people will be there. There are perhaps 15 people at this meeting, including Robert and Harvey Freeman and Alexander Cooper and his team. Alex is the architect city planner I hired two months ago to take over the design of the project after it became clear that my original architect, Helmut John, just wasn't making it with the city. I don't know if the reason was his Germanic style or the fact that he is based in Chicago rather than New York, or just that he's a little too slick. I do know that he wasn't getting anywhere with the city planning commission. Alex, by contrast, was formerly a city planner himself, and he's almost a legend in that office. He's also the guy who designed Battery Park City, which has gotten great press. Politically, he's a much better choice than Helmut John, and I'm a very practical guy. We've been meeting like this every week for the past couple of months to hash out a broad plan, including where to locate the residential buildings, the streets, the parks, and the shopping mall. Today, Alex has brought preliminary drawings of the layout we've agreed on. At the southern end of the prospective NBC studios, adjacent to the world's tallest building, then heading north, there are the residential buildings facing east over a boulevard and west over a huge eight block long shopping mall and out at the river. Every apartment has a great view, which I believe is critical. I am very happy with the new layout and Alex seems happy too. I happen to think the tall buildings are what will make this project special, but I'm not naive about zoning. Eventually, I know we're gonna have to make some concessions. On the other hand, if the city won't approve something I think makes sense economically, I'll just wait for the next administration and try again. This site is only going to get more valuable. 6 p.m. I excuse myself because I'm due at an early dinner and it's not the kind to be late for. Ivana and I have been invited by John Cardinal O'Connor to have dinner at St. Patrick's Cathedral. 7 p.m. No matter whom you've met over the years, there is something incredible about sitting down to dinner with the Cardinal and a half dozen of his top bishops and priests in a private dining room at St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's hard not to be a little awed. We talk about politics, the city, real estate, and a half dozen other subjects, and it's a fascinating evening. 
As we leave, I tell Ivana how impressed I am with the Cardinal. He's not only a man of great warmth, he's also a businessman with great political instincts. Friday, 6.30 a.m. I'm leafing through the New York Times when I come to a huge picture of the concrete being poured onto Woolman Rink. It's on the front page of the second section. This story just won't quit. 9.15 a.m. We meet with the city on the West Side Yards project. Almost everyone from yesterday's meeting is there, and we are joined by four city planners, including Rebecca Robinson and Con Howe, who are directly in charge of evaluating our project. Alex does the presentation, and he's very good. Mostly, he emphasizes the things we know the city is going to like, the public parks, the easy access to the waterfront, the ways we've devised to move traffic in and out. The only time the density issue comes up, how tall the buildings will be, Alex just says we're still working it out. When it's over, we all agree it went very well. 10.30 a.m., I go back to my office for a meeting to discuss progress on construction at Trump Park, the condominium I'm building out of the steel shell of the Barbizon Plaza Hotel on Central Park South. It's an incredible location, and the building we're redoing will be a great success. The meeting includes Frank Williams, my architect on the project, Andrew Weiss, the project manager, and Blanche Sprague, an executive vice president who is in charge of sales. Frank, who is very soft-spoken, is a fine architect. Blanchette, my nickname for her, is a classic. She's got a mouth that won't quit, which is probably why she's so good at sales. I like to tell her that she must be a very tough woman to live with. The truth is I get a great kick out of her. We start by talking about what color to use on the frames of the windows. Details like these make all the difference in the look and ambience of a building. After almost a half hour, we finally agree on a light beige that will blend right into the color of the stone. I happen to like earth tones. They are richer and more elegant than primary colors. 11 a.m., Frank Williams leaves, and we turn to a discussion of the demolition work at Trump Park. Andy tells me it's not finished and that the contractor has just given us a $175,000 bill for extras. Extras are the costs a contractor adds to his original bid every time you request any change in the plan you initially agreed on. You have to be very rough and very tough with most contractors or they'll take the shirt right off your back. I pick up the phone and dial the guy in charge of demolition at Trump Park. Steve, I say when I get him, this is Donald Trump. Listen, you've got to get your ass moving and get finished. You're behind. I want you to get personally involved in this. He starts to give me explanations, but I cut him off. I don't want to know. I just want you to get the job done and get out. And listen, Steve, you're killing me on these extras. I don't want you to deal with Andy anymore on the extras. I want you to deal with me personally. If you try screwing me on this job, you won't be getting a second chance. I'll never hire you again. My second concern is the laying of floors. I ask Andy for the number of our concrete guy. Okay, I say, only half joking. I'm going to take my life in my hands now. Concrete guys can be extremely rough. I get the number two guy on the line. Look, I say to him, your boss wanted this contract very badly. I was set to give it to someone else, but he told me he'd do a great job. I walked the site yesterday, and the patches you're making aren't level with the existing concrete. In some places, they're as much as a quarter inch off. The guy doesn't have any response, so I keep talking. Nobody has the potential to give you more work in the future than Trump. I'm going to be building when everyone else has gone bust. So do me a favor. Get this thing done right. This time, the guy has a response. Every guy on the job is a pro, he says. We've given you our best men, Mr. Trump. Good, I say. Call me later and let me know how you're doing. 12 o'clock, noon. Alan Greenberg calls to tell me that Holiday has gone ahead and enacted some poison pill provisions that will weigh the company down with debt and make it much less attractive as a takeover target. I'm not worried. No poison pill is going to keep me from going after Holiday Inn if that's what I decide I want to do. The market is still taking a drubbing. It was off 80 points yesterday, and it's down another 25 today. But Holiday is off only a point. Alan tells me that we've now bought almost 5% of the company, 12.15 p.m. 
Blanche stays on after Andy leaves to get me to choose a print advertisement for Trump Park. She shows me a half dozen choices, and I don't like any of them. She is furious. Blanche wants to use a line drawing that shows the building and its panoramic views of Central Park. I like the idea of a line drawing, I tell her, but I don't like these. Also, I want a drawing that shows more of the building. Central Park is great, but in the end, I'm not selling a park. I'm selling a building and apartments. 12.30 p.m., Norma comes in, carrying a huge pile of forms I have to sign as part of my application for a Nevada gaming license. While I'm signing, Norma asks who I want to use 